Hello and welcome to Bethel Church Online. I'm Michael Gandhi, one of the team pastors here at Bethel Church. It's great to have you with us online. Today, Pastor Frank's message is titled, Worth the Wait. God teaches us in His Word to wait. I know this message will speak to you. We need to stay connected, especially now. Make sure to subscribe to our social media channels by clicking the subscribe button. And don't forget, hit the like button. Bethel family, now is the time to share these links. Invite someone to Bethel. It's never been easier. Thank you for sticking with us. Pastor Frank will be on in just a moment. I wanna let you know of something we have coming up. Next weekend is Memorial Day weekend. We hope you will join us for one of the finest things Bethel Church does all year long. It's called Bethel Remembers. Join us for an hour where we honor the fallen heroes and Gold Star families with special music and a message from Pastor Frank. If you miss any of the information, check the chat or let us know by asking questions. And now let's lean into what God has in store for us as Pastor Frank gives us today's message. Hey, well, good morning and welcome to Bethel Church Online. We're glad that you tuned in today. Big shout out to San Jose and Santa Clara campuses as well. We're so glad that you are part of this Sunday and all of you who are guests. So I wanted to talk to you just for a couple of moments about some things that I think are worth reminding us of. And then we're going to jump into today's teaching. First of all, I want to remind everybody there are ways to connect during the week. And I really want to encourage you to take advantage of that. If you go to Bethel.org, you will see up top, uh, it will say uh, Church Online. And once you click that, there's a whole slew of groups in which you can jump in and be a part of. Divorce care, grief share, uh, even those that are struggling with depression or managing some other mental illness struggles. Lots of groups for support. Uh, Our seniors, Okay, our seniors have a group, uh, and then men's and women's, we're kicking those off. So so there's lots of opportunities for you to connect, and I really want to encourage you to do that. Want to remind you, Bethel remembers next Sunday, so please invite. And then finally, I'm going to be giving a state of the church address. Kind of update us on where we're at, where we hope to be going uh, soon. So I invite you to do that uh, and to look for that rather and tune in for that as well. So you might be wondering why uh, I've got a bottle of ketchup right here and I've got some food. Well, what I've done, I've invited uh, Pastor John today to actually help me with an illustration as we kick off this new teaching series today. And uh, we actually want to simulate a commercial. I want to see if you know the commercial. Do you know the product? And then do you know who sang the song. Bonus points if you know who sang the song. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to simulate this commercial, and then I want you to go to the chat room. Tell me what the product name is. And again, do you know who sang the song? Pastor John. Anticipation. Anticipation. It's keeping me awake. Well, there you go. And uh, this is pretty thick ketchup right here. So um, as you can see, uh, it was keeping me waiting as well. Hey, you can eat that? Uh, no, go ahead. Yeah, you can, you can have it. Thanks. Thanks for your help today. Um, all right. What's the commercial? Go to the chat. Go to the chat box. What was the, what was the product? Heinz ketchup, right? Heinz Ketchup. Who sang the song? Carly Simon. Carly Simon. Well, that's certainly a blast from the past. Um, But the reality of what that song and what that commercial was illustrating, man, it is as fresh as today's headlines, right? You're keeping me waiting, waiting, waiting. Well, we all get that today. 7.8 7.8 billion people who populate our planet today and a good swath of them have been waiting. <laughs> They've just been waiting. We've been waiting to get on the other side of COVID-19. Uh, it's funny, that commercial, it actually aired in 1979, but it is so, so relevant for today. The tagline is the taste that's worth the wait. Well, I want to talk to you today about Worth the Wait. That's the name of our new series. Over the next few weeks, we're going to unpack that idea. Uh, The reality is there are some things that are definitely worth waiting for. And we're going to look at the lives of several different people out of God's Word and how God leveraged waiting in their 
lives. I think you're going to find it helpful and meaningful today. All of them faced big time delays, all of them, but they emerged better. They came out better on the other side, and that's our goal. That's at least my goal for us as well. Let me give you the big idea of this series right out of the gate. You can post this today. Uh, it, it, it's also in an outline. If you go to the right bottom corner, you can open up the outline. You can fill in some blanks and follow along with us today. We hope that you'll do that, but here's the post. Some things in life are worth the wait. Some things in life are worth the wait. And we're going to drill down on that idea for the next several weeks. Here's the reality. Everyone God has ever used, everyone that God has ever used in any meaningful way, in any significant way, were made to wait. They were made to wait. Now, before you get discouraged and tune out and say, I'm done, I'm checking out, stay with me. Because the good news is it's worth the wait. And that's what we're going to see uh, in this series. There's a payoff that's attached to the waiting. And today we look at a guy by the name of Joseph. And uh, Joseph's story is in Genesis 37. If you have your Bible or you have it on smart device today, you can go to the first book of the Bible, the book of beginnings, Genesis 37. How do we win while we're waiting? Joseph teaches us that today. Let me say it differently for you. How can my day end well when not all is going well? How, how can we win while we're waiting? We learn this from Joseph. How can you and I face the things that are uncertain or unwelcome in our life? How do we face those things and still flourish or grow in our lives? How do you and I get on the other side of COVID stronger and better than when it's all, the whole thing started? Well, we're going to really drill down on that. How do we win while we're waiting? In Genesis chapter 37, Joseph's story begins. It ends in Genesis chapter 50. Fourteen chapters are, are dedicated to this guy. More than his great-grandfather Abraham, more than his grandfather Isaac, more than his father Jacob or Israel. It's dedicated to him. And he's a great, he's a great example of how we win while we wait. So let's look at the opening verses to get us started today. Genesis 37, 1 through 5. They read this way. Jacob lived, that's Joseph's father. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line or his family tree. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Nobody likes a tattler, okay? That's what Joseph did. He went and told on his brothers. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any of the other sons. Israel, another name for Jacob. Loved, loved him more than all of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he had made him an ornate robe, right? Coat of many colors for him. Verse 4, when his brothers saw that their father, father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Verse 5, Joseph had a dream, and when he told his brothers the dream, they hated him all the more. After that first dream, as you read on in that section, you get to verse 8, and it says, and they hated him all the more again. They hated him. I mean, 10 verses, two dreams, three times we're told they hated Joseph. One time he's rebuked by his father. It's not a good start to meaningful relationships in your life. And it's certainly not a good start on his journey of life. Uh, from the beginning, Joseph was this special kid. He was just special to Jacob or special to Israel. He was highly favored, so much more favored than the rest of his brothers. And his dad didn't even try to hide it. Imagine growing up in a family like that. His dad did just the opposite. He celebrated the fact that he loved Joseph all, more than all of, his, all of his other sons. How did he celebrate it? A coat of many colors. A coat of many colors. This ornate robe, if you will. Now, if you grew up in Sunday school at all as a kid, uh, you remember hearing about Joseph's bright colored coat. Uh, what, what's, what, what's, what's the big deal? Well, uh, it wasn't a short vest like we often learned if you were a kid in Sunday school. It was actually very long and flowing. Uh, and it was definitely would have been uh, like a robe, 
or like a, like, like a tunic. Maybe you have seen Andrew Lloyd Webber's Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. And uh, Laura and I saw it live in San Diego some years ago. It's fantastic. But, but here's a picture of how they portrayed Joseph's uh, coat of many colors. Well, uh, ch chances are it isn't um, that elaborate, okay? But what's important to understand is Joseph would have had a rectangular piece of cloth that came diagonally across his chest. It's important to understand that. That's what that coat would have had because the point is it was a sign of someone who ruled. It was a sign of someone in authority. It was not the sign of a laborer, and it was not the sign of a slave. And it certainly wasn't the sign of the youngest son. If you know Joseph's story, and if you don't read it, it's fascinating, okay? But you know that his brothers actually hated him enough to stage his death. And they pushed him into this big cistern. It's like a limestone hole in the ground to catch rainwater. And, and, they, and they were going to leave him there and let the animals eat him up eat him up, when all of a sudden there's this caravans coming and they're going to Egypt and instead they sold him as a slave to this caravan. Uh, they sold him for the typical 20 shekels, that's what slaves were going for in those days, but 20 shekels was two years wages for a shepherd like his brothers. In other words, they made serious coin on their youngest brother. They dip Joseph's coat of many colors in goat blood. They take it back to their father and they tell, they lie to their father that your most beloved son is dead. And they broke their father's heart. And you thought your family was dysfunctional. Wow, right? Joseph went from favored son to hated brother to slave. And it happened pretty darn quick. And in his story, we learn how to wait and win at the same time. Joseph shows us it's worth the wait. What are you waiting on God for today? Go to the chat room just for a moment. Just go to the chat box and you don't have to share a lot of detail. Whatever, your, whatever level of comfort you're at with sharing, but Maybe a phrase. Uh, I, I can tell you right now, Laura and I are praying for family members that don't know Jesus. We're waiting. We're waiting. Uh, we're waiting to get into our house because there's been a series of delays. And we're hoping that's actually going to happen tomorrow. It's actually going to happen Monday. Uh, but what are you waiting for? What are you waiting on God for? Uh, I want to leave you today with three beliefs that will change the way you and I view our weights, okay? It will change everything about how we view waiting and it will help us win while we wait. Let's jump into it. I'll leave you with these four takeaways out of the life of, Jacob, uh, of uh, Joseph. Number one, believe God is always working his good plan. This is the first belief that I want to drill down on. Believe that God is always always working his good plan. God was working his good plan when Joseph was given the coat of many colors and was named that favored son. God was working his good plan when he, he gave Joseph not one, but two dreams, two dreams that illustrated that he would one day rule. It would define his future. It would define his family. God was working his good plan. God was working his good plan when he became the hated brother. Don't miss this. God was still working his good plan when David was, uh, when David, when Joseph was left in a pit and he was sold into slavery. God was working his good plan when Joseph rose to power in Potiphar's house. And you can read all about this in his story in Genesis. God was working his good plan when Joseph was falsely accused of sexual assault. You heard me right. God was still working his good plan. God was working his good plan when Joseph was thrown in prison. He rose to power in prison. He was then forgotten in prison. And later on, he was remembered again in prison. God was still working his good plan. He was working his good plan when Joseph was brought from prison to Pharaoh himself, the most powerful person on the planet, to interpret his dream, his dream. When Joseph would rise to power yet again, and he would become the second in command over Egypt, the most powerful nation on earth at that time, God was working his good plan. 
And God was working his good plan when J Joseph would finally face his brothers. I want you to think about this for a moment. He would finally face his brother. The brutal rejection that he faced 13 years earlier, that he suffered 13 long years before he would see his brothers again. God was working his good plan and he would use Joseph to save his family and to save the world from famine. And through it all, through it all, all that Joseph faced, he faced rejection, he faced promotion, he faced abandonment, he faced achievement, he faced sorrow, he faced celebration. Sounds a lot like life, right? A lot like life. Through all of that, Joseph would summarize all that he had went through in the well-known phrase at the end of his story in Genesis 50 and verse 20, and some of you will recognize it. Joseph told his brothers after his brothers confessed to him many years later, as for you, you meant evil against me. He named it. He was honest about what happened. He didn't cover over it. He shared what it was. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive or saved as they are today. Joseph's story teaches us that God can be trusted in all the seasons of our life, the good and the bad, the ups and the down. He can be trusted when we face the uncertain and the unwelcome, when it's breathing down our necks, he can be trusted. And we'll come out on top. Joseph did. We'll win. We'll come sooner or later. We'll come out on top. This life or the next life, we win if we will trust him. Believe that God is always working his good plan. A second takeaway, a second belief that changes everything about how we approach our waiting, our times of waiting. Believe God works through flawed people. Believe God works through flawed people. Aren't you glad? I mean, think about it. It's the only kind of people there are in this world is flawed people. In Silicon Valley, that's all there is, is flawed people. At Bethel Church, that's all there is. And every other church for that matter. We, it, it, it's flawed people. When I read Joseph's story, his family story, I think to myself, man, I, I mean, I've been upset with my parents. I've been upset with my siblings. I've been, I've been upset with my kids. But it never occurred to me to plot to kill them. I mean, it never occurred to me to push him into a pit and leave him for dead. Uh, Joseph's family puts the D in dysfunction. And I love the Bible for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons is it tells the whole story. When I was in seminary some years ago, I had a class that focused on an Old Testament text that was one of those more difficult ones. There are some places in the Bible that makes us scratch our heads sometimes. And so we were wrestling with this text in seminary and uh, just a really kind of an ugly, ugly place. And my prof, mid-sentence, literally, my professor, he says to our cohort, he just stops and he says, look it. He says, the only hero in the Bible is God, his son, and his spirit. The only hero in the Bible is God, his son, and his spirit. Because we were unpacking the ugliness of the underbelly of humanity in that passage. I built an entire leadership talk on that very idea. and Someday I'll share it with you. God possesses the ability to work his good purpose through bad people. Don't miss that. How many times do I see Christians check out? And they go, you know what? Because so-and-so was leading this, because so-and-so was over here in government, because so-and-so was doing this stuff in this country. Oh man, God is completely absent. No, he's not. Read the Bible. God works good things through bad people. He did it all the time. Joseph's life is a great example of this. See, in our eyes, we read his story and we go, oh my word, rejection, betrayal, heartache, sorrow, suffering, struggle. And we look at those things and we go, these are things to just merely endure. We just got to get through. I hope I'll survive. Now, th there's a lot of value for endurance. I get that. But when God looks at it, he looks at Joseph's story. It's more than surviving. He comes along and he says, look it, 
I want to actually break in and do good through these things and through these people who aren't good. Joseph's story teaches us a completely different way to view the uncertain and the unwelcome in our lives. In God's eyes, it was an opportunity. It was an opportunity to break in, do good when things aren't good. Some of the ugliest things in the world have been redeemed by God for good. The crucifixion is the greatest example of that. Number three, believe God's blessing includes hardship. This is a tough one for those of us that live in the West, especially in America. Believe God's blessing includes hardship. I'm all for comfortable. I'm a fan. But I'm here to tell you, life is not all comfortable. And all of us know that. But what I want us to understand is that God's blessing actually includes hardship. My longtime friend, one of the best leaders that I know, Hal Donaldson, he's the co-founder and the president of Convoy of Hope. Hal said a few years ago, I wrote it down, I hope to never forget what he said. This is what he said. When the mission is right, when what you're doing is right, both miracles and hardship will follow. Joseph would learn that God's dream for his life, it was a phenomenal dream. Just like God's dream for your life is a phenomenal dream. But Joseph would learn that it would include hardship. These are, these are subjects that are talked throughout the scripture. Fast forward to the New Testament and the Apostle Peter. He writes to a group that is absolutely feeling the heat. It is a tough season in their lives. And this is what he writes in 1 Peter in his first letter. 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13. This is the New Living Translation. Dear friends, he writes, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, verse 13, be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have a wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed in all the world. Jesus suffered hardship. We suffer hardship. And when we suffer and when we struggle for what is right, what is right, not what is wrong, although God can redeem that as well, but what is right, the blessing and the reward will follow. This life or the next, blessing will follow. A final takeaway. Number four, believe that God's purpose will prevail. This is where hope breaks in. This is where hope breaks in. Believe that God's purpose will prevail. It is easy to confuse God's will and his purpose for our lives. Sometimes they're the same, okay? His will and his purpose, sometimes they're the same. Sometimes they're not the same. Joseph's a great example. In Joseph's life, was it God's will that his brothers would hate him and they would threaten him and literally commit a criminal act of selling their own family member into slavery? Was that God's perfect will? Probably not. But did God use it for his purpose, to accomplish his purpose in Joseph's life? What was the purpose? He needed to get Joseph to Egypt so that eventually he'd be able to save his own family and save the world from famine and, and, and zoom out, preserve the family tree of Messiah, which would come through his brother, Judah. Okay, that was the big picture of what's going on in Joseph's story. All right. Uh, was it God's will that he be falsely accused and he's imprisoned for sexual assault, something he never did? No, that's not God's will. But God used it to get him in front of Pharaoh. That was the purpose that he accomplished through that injustice. Peter, again, writes about this stuff. First Peter 1, verses 3 through 6. Powerful verses. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again. Because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. The resurrection means everything. Now we live with great expectation. 
And we have a priceless inheritance. Don't miss these words. An inheritance that is kept, that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change or decay. Oh my word. Verse five. And through your faith, through your trust in Jesus, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation. In other words, until you receive the full benefit of what Jesus accomplished on the cross and the empty grave. He says, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. Jesus is coming back. He's coming again a second time. So be truly glad this wonderful joy for this wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. Well, I want to leave you with a quote today, and then I want to pray for you. Orson Scott Card is a prolific uh, novelist. You might have heard his name. Chances are you've heard of the books or even the movie that's been made after his books, uh, The Ender's Game and The Ender's Series. Huge sci-fi sellers. And um, in one of the books, in The Ender's Shadow, he records a rather profound uh, conversation. And this is what he says. And I want to I I read it to you. Look, This is the way the conversation goes. He says, do you know why Satan is so angry all the time? Because whenever he works a particular clever bit of mischief, God uses it to serve his own righteous purposes. So this is a conversation. So the other person asks, so God uses wicked people as his tools? God gives us the freedom to do great evil if we choose. Then he uses his own freedom to create goodness out of that evil. For that is what he, that is God, chooses. So in the long run, God always wins? Yes. In the short run, though, it can be uncomfortable. God's purpose will prevail. It will always prevail. But in the short term, it can sometimes be uncomfortable, uncomfortable. Four ways, four ways to view our waiting that changes everything about those times in which we wait. And these four views, these four beliefs help us win while we're waiting. Let me pray with you this morning. Jesus, thank you for the stories that have been preserved for us today. The story of Joseph who lived thousands of years ago It's a story that is reminiscent of our story to a greater or lesser degree. Because we all know what it is to face injustice. We all know what it is to be mistreated. We all know what it is to suffer at the hands of, of others. We all know what it is to have to wait. To have to wait for the good to come about. And I pray in this moment for those who wait. And I know there are many today that are waiting on you, God to break in on a situation, to break in on a set of circumstances, to break in and to bring good out of what isn't. And I pray in this moment for hope to rise in every heart. I pray for that today. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would fill them with the hope and that these four truths will indeed cause hope to rise in them. And now I pray today, Lord, for those whom you are waiting And I would just say today, friend, is God waiting on you for something? Is he waiting for you to say yes to something in your life? He's ready to bring a breakthrough. He's ready to bring blessing. He's just waiting for you to say yes. Is he waiting for you to say yes to his son today? Jesus, if that's you in this moment, invite Jesus in. Or reestablish a relationship maybe that has gone, gone cold in your heart. Why not just invite him in? Why not just pray? You can pray a simple prayer like this. Jesus, I come to you today just as I am. I give you the good, the bad, the ugly in my life as best as I know how. Come into my life. Be the forgiver. Be the leader of my life. And then help me to learn how to win while I'm waiting. Pray that prayer today, friend, and mean it, and he'll answer that prayer in your life. 
And here at Bethel Church, we want to help you on your spiritual journey today. Would you let us know you prayed that prayer? There's, there's an easy way to do that. Hello at Bethel.org. Hello at Bethel.org. And you can just say, hey, I prayed the prayer. You can go to the chat room. You can just say, hey, I prayed the prayer because there'll be an invitation. Uh, we'll have right at the conclusion of our time today, there'll be a little Zoom lobby that we have. And, and if you're new or if you have prayed that prayer, you're welcome to be a part of that. There's a free gift for you there. I hope that you'll let us know today that you prayed that prayer. And I pray God's blessing on your life as you learn how to wait and win. God bless you. Thanks for tuning in today.